everyone. Welcome to first online Go Talk. Um, we will wait for about like five minutes to other participants joining the session. And if you have some technical difficulties during the session, let's say you can hear my voice clearly, or you can you cannot see the screen. You just can use chat feature. Um, you can see in the down of your screen. Um, you can talk to our panelists to ask some questions regarding the technical issues. And also during the session, you can ask ask questions in through Q and A box, and then you also can vote other people questions, and then we will pick maybe a couple of questions in the end of the session to have sort of discussion with our speakers as well. Okay, before we started, maybe I can just um, give you a little bit context who is our speaker today. Um, our speaker today is Diane Rosanti. She, is, um, she has been working as a product manager for more than eight years and six years of it, I think, um, she working remotely. And now she is joining us uh, from California. Uh, it's midnight over there, and I'm so thankful that I can have her as our first speaker in a GoTalk online session. And me personally, uh, think that um, respect Dian as a one of our women leaders in Gojek because she introduced me to a lot of kind of documentation, um, a lot of like I know. Darcy, I know silent meeting through her and also she's caring about other people um, life caring about our mental health even though I'm not her team directly but she cared about my well-being and other that um, so we start to call Median here hi Median hello uh, are you so Median. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, even though it's midnight in California. How's thing over there? It's okay. You know, it's uh, I have my coffee and it's 11 p.m. So it's not too bad. Some, you know, my Mondays and my Tuesdays is my overlap days with Asia. So I'm used to staying up late. Um, but only on Mondays and Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and how's the situation over there given that this um, coronavirus situation? Um, I think like a lot of places, it, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, mm -hmm. Like how long this will last, how long the crisis will last, how long the lockdown and shelter in place orders will last. I think luckily in California, we, our governor, you know, ordered the shelter in place uh, a lot earlier than a, a lot of the other states in the U.S. So I think the curve, you know, has flattened a bit uh, in our state, um, in California. Um, but you know, we're not we're not uh, lifting the lockdown anytime soon. So we're mm -hmm. staying at home, um, only going out for the essentials, uh, trying to order everything online as well as I'm sure a lot of people in. Uh, Indonesia is also doing using Gojek, hopefully. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's the same here. Yeah. Yeah. Here we cannot live without Gojek and also the other online services like to buying groceries or even to buy like medicines. I use the online feature as well. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to check in to the audience. Uh, can you guys hear us clearly? You can use the um, raise hand feature. You can just raise your hand if you hear us clearly. Okay, there's a lot of people raising hand. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, my screen full of people raising hand. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. I lower the hands now. And uh, right now we are having like 80 people joining and maybe we'll more coming. Um, today's session is about like product management in the time of Corona. I know that you be buddy and also product manager but I think this also useful for you that are not product managers as a normal human being so you can maybe learning about how to stay sane and other things during this COVID situation 
And also guys, I hope you are healthy at home, you are happy, you are doing fine. You know that if you have like some problems, maybe you just can uh, reach out to your friends or joining our talk session as well. And while awaiting other people, you might be want to grab your snacks, have a lunch, or have your pillow, making yourself comfortable during the session. Um, Badian will be sharing about like maybe 40 minutes and then after that we can have um, Q&A session. Oh, also, if you if you want to like um, share the session through your social media, maybe you can mention at Life at Gojek. Um, you can maybe share to us about what you learned from the session or what your feedback about us. And if you have special requests, feel free to reach out to us to maybe, or if you want to be the speakers as a guest speaker here, feel free to reach out to community at gojek.com or just DMing live at Gojek. Yeah, okay. Okay, so um, now we have like 100 people joining. While I stop sharing my screen, I'll pass the session to Median. Maybe you can start turn on your video and presenting your session. I'll remind you again, guys, um, for the participants, you can ask questions through the Q&A box and then other people also can vote if you have like um, other people questions. Hey, hi everybody. I'm just turning on my video. Hello. <laughs> um, and thank you, Yolanda, for the very kind introduction. Yep. Uh, I'm just gonna set up my screen share. If you just give me one moment. Okay, can everybody see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Yeah, everybody seeing your screen. Okay, and this time. Ian, your the stitch and the screen <laughs> is yours now. Thank you. All right. So, can everybody see my slides changing now? Just because sometimes there's a lag, so I want to check. All good? Okay, great. So thank you for joining us here today. Uh, I'm really, you know, uh, happy to be here. Thank you for having me go talk. So today I wanna talk a little bit about product management in the time of Corona, which has been uh, a very interesting time for all of us, I'm sure. Uh, and I wanna kind of break it down in a few pieces here. Um, first, I think like a few notes on uh, how you know, product managers can uh, react to these times, uh, during these uncertain times. The second piece is I want to share a little bit about like how Gojek product teams are staying effective while we have gone fully remote. Uh, so some tools and tips and tricks um, from our best practices. And then the third piece is I think, I, you know, this is a, an incredibly challenging time for a lot of people, not just product managers. So I wanted to give a little bit of a personal uh, take on this talk and share uh, some of the things I'm doing to stay sane during isolation and complete work from home. So why am I here today, right? Um, I, I, I want to kind of share a little bit of how I've been able to refine my remote practices, uh, product management, as well as my own well-being. Um, I, you know, a few years ago, I started developing a lot of these best practices when I was a product manager at change.org, where um, you know, product engineering were in San Francisco and Victoria, BC in Canada. Our customers and stakeholders are all over the world. Uh, we actually have an office in, in Jakarta, Indonesia, and, you know, also across the Americas and Europe. Uh, there I established like the product liaison program where, you know, it really built like bridges between product and engineering and uh, the, the stakeholders um, who are distributed all across the world. Um, I also, you know, have quite a lot of experience like working through different time zones through my uh, work at Zola Electric, which is a startup, a solar startup uh, headquartered out of uh, East Africa. So we had our product um, uh, and data teams in San Francisco and Tanzania. Engineering was all across the world, spread across like Russia and a bunch of different U.S. cities and different time zones. And I think even you know, we had some engineers in Africa uh, and of course our customers and operations were all across East Africa. So that was, you know, 
a lot of the practices that I, you know, now do on a daily basis, I refine a lot of it there when I was working at Thola Electric. And of course, at Gojek, as Yolanda mentioned, right, um, you know, uh, you, most of you probably know that we have offices across Indonesia, India, Singapore, and also a couple of other Southeast Asian countries. Uh, we actually have a few people out here in California. And so that's the biggest challenge has been to uh, ensure that we can work across very different time zones um, while maintaining everybody's well-being, but also to ensure that we have ways to stay connected to what's happening in the market, even though that we're far away. Cool. So <laughs> lastly, I was actually ahead, probably about four weeks ahead of all of you in this quarantine because in February, I broke my leg really badly, actually, in three places. That's an actual x-ray of my uh, leg. Um, it's uh, broken in like three different places. I'm not fully walking right now. Uh, as I speak to you, I'm like hobbling around in crutches around my home. Um, so I think that like that also really forced me to kind of think about like what are the things that I need to be doing at home to stay well um, when I'm completely confined and isolated in my home. So that's been a good practice as well. Okay, so let's move to the first section. How can product teams react to these really uncertain times? Um, a few ways, I think. So I think the, the most important thing that we did as soon as we realized that this was a crisis uh, that was coming and might stick around for some time is, you know, as product teams, we revisited our objectives. Uh, we needed to change them um, as per the needs of like the business survival for the next few months and kind of think about all the different scenarios, right? Um, I can't share specific examples, obviously, but um, I can share the framework uh, by which we like did, you know, uh, the revisiting of our objectives. So our company and our product teams um, based our priorities and our roadmaps based on the OKR system, objectives and key results. So we had them set already, right? Um, but with these changing times, we basically had to revisit most of them. And a framework that we use that was really helpful is to kind of look at each key result and each, you know, from each objective and decide, do we keep this? Because it's fundamental and it doesn't actually change despite the crisis. Do we keep this, but rebase, you know, basically reset the targets, right, of the key result because it no longer makes sense in a time of crisis. So I think a lot of uh, priorities will fall in this bucket because you can want to continue on those business objectives, but perhaps because the market has changed so much, you need to uh, reset those um, targets to something more reasonable. And then there are some things that is immediately, you know, something that you might want to deprioritize. I think some of the more maybe experimental, um, you know, products uh, that we had in mind that was for a longer term strategy um, might have made mo more sense, you know, during like peace time, but like during like crisis time, uh, it wasn't maybe worth the risk. So it was very easy to kind of call out some of the, those objectives and say, this is definitely deprioritized. And then there's a whole other, you know, bucket of work, I think, where it will take more time to decide whether or not you want to keep it or deprioritize it. I put that in the reconsider bucket. I think even, you know, uh, like four to six weeks now into kind of uh, managing through this crisis, there are still a few areas uh, where we, we want some more time to analyze and decide whether or not a product opportunity is still worth pursuing versus not. So we're still in the middle of that. Um, so I think it's okay to like, be you know move really quickly on certain things and be very decisive but take some time also to make sure that you're not you know just uh putting away um opportunities that you might want to lean into during this time i think it's also really important not to be tone deaf um right um uh, as some as a product you know organization that has a diversified portfolio of products we see some some of our product lines affected in different ways, right? Um, for a Tailwind product where actually we might um, benefit from the crisis, right? It's a really delicate balance between pivoting to survive and being too opportunistic and actually taking advantage of suffering. So the way that we have tried to manage this balance at Gojek is to remember how important it is for us to stay ethical and to stay customer first, right? So even when we're trying to make sure that we are, you know, pursuing opportunities that are good for our business, we, we always keep 
front of mind, you know, uh, how do we ensure the safety and the well-being of our customers and drivers and merchants and all the users of our ecosystem first? And so, you know, that we were able to prioritize um, things quickly that were good for our business, but also still the best for our users. Um, you know, so things that, you know, we want to do in terms of minimizing infections led to, you know, launching uh, contactless delivery for go food within a matter of you know a couple of weeks uh, we launched some initiatives not just like product wise but collaborating with other parts of the business to figure out how we cushion the income of affected drivers because all of our service providers are affected by this crisis um, I think this is also a really good time you know to audit uh, business as usual activities and consider if some of them need to be paused we did that with some of our promos and push notifications, for example. Uh, some of them might just seem really insensitive during a time like this. So like look at the content, right? And make sure that you're not sending things that might come off as tone deaf and insensitive to your users. And in a way like, you know, at, at a time where probably cost cutting is, um, you know, a higher priority than during peacetime, right? Uh, pausing some of these efforts might actually curb your burn rate. So that's important to look at as well. Um, another thing I think that, um, you know, I like to kind of call this, you know, wartime versus peacetime product management and um, knowing like what muscles to flex and what skills to use as a PM versus what to kind of um, reconsider during this time is, you know, we often think about good product managers as people who obsess really on, on two aspects, right? Finding out the why for everything. We question everything. Saying no if requests are not backed by strong data and research and in-depth analysis. Um, but to quote like one of our product leaders uh, at Gojek, DK, who I really respect, you know, these are really extraordinary times. And so you need to be very, um, I think, careful, like, where you push back and where you need to be really decisive. And I think the really, you know, uh, the PM leaders that we really need during like wartime uh, like this uh, is to the PMs who know, you know, when to actually move ahead with limited information and be really decisive in spite of limited information. So I think it's very, very important to stay cognizant of that and be open to moving more quickly and more decisively than you are used to, even though you don't have the full data and listening a lot more closely to like some of your business stakeholders who you might want to push back on during normal times and actually listen to them and keep the communication lines really, really open during this time because things are evolving really, really quickly and you also need to respond a lot more quickly. Um, so moving on to the next area, right? Um, this is the fun, uh, part, I think, of kind of sharing a little bit uh, more about how Gojek does product management and how our product and engineering teams operate. Uh, specifically, how do we stay effective while going fully remote? So the great part about working at Gojek is that we've, you know, we are already really distributed. So these practices already exist. Uh, now they just become a lot more important because, you know, people who used to be in the same office also can no longer be co-located but we developed a lot of these practices because we've had to, you know, collaborate between product engineering, design and business across, you know, India, Singapore, Indonesia, and all the other offices. So here's a little bit about how we do this. Um, here's how we manage expectations through um, making it really clear uh, on any project program, you know, product release or even a decision, right? Uh, we like to use this framework that we call Darcy, uh, where the D is basically the ultimate decision maker for a project or a decision. Um, the accountable might be the same person as the decider sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's the person reporting to the decider, but it's the person, <laughs> it's the one single person who's accountable for making it happen. So uh, even if there's a lot of people who are working around the, for the project or around a decision, the accountable has to be one person because then you know who to go to and hold accountable if something, uh, if you need something around the project. Um, and the rest of it is, I think, you know, basically the, the people working uh, on a project or a decision um, 
the the responsible are those people it's i think we we try to keep that group as small as possible um, because that helps um, faster decision making and then the last two groups the consultant and the informed are the people you kind of you know are your stakeholders basically but i think it's very helpful to clarify what type of stakeholder um, do you have on this project or in this decision so this the c and the i clarifies that a lot where you know the people in the consulted group uh, are the people that you want um, to get feedback from, right? You you kind of tell them about progress and you ask them for feedback and you need that feedback from them for your project, product, or decision to be successful. Uh, it's helpful also when you when you when you have a bigger list of people in the consultant group to specify what kind of feedback or engagement you need from them. Um, that's a best practice that we have. So even within the C uh, group, you're very clear. Like this group of C is the primary consultant your feedback is blocking and we can't move forward on certain decisions without you. Whereas here is like a secondary group of consulted where, you know, your feedback is very helpful, but um, not blocking in certain milestones. So we try to specify that as well. And the inform is basically your wider stakeholder list, right? Um, this is more of an FYI role. Feedback is welcome, but completely optional. And this framework basically makes it really easy whenever, you know, there's like a lot of back and forth on a decision for a project or like something is getting blocked and you're not sure who can decide on this because, you know, you've kind of escalated and you're not sure like where to go next. Yeah. And you can just refer to the project or the product Darcy to, to see like, oh, here are the people I need to talk to. Here are the people I need to get feedback from. If I'm stuck, here's the ultimate decision maker. And if I don't know where else to go, I go to the D and the A. So that's been really helpful, I think, for Gojek um, to use, but even more so when, you know, a lot of things are hit happening asynchronously. So here's an example, basically, of how, you know, we did Darcy for one of the programs within the product management function where, you know, we, we uh, I, I was the decider for uh, improvements on our PM hiring program. I had somebody on my team who was accountable driving the entire project, including setting all the goals and deliverables. Uh, she was working with a cross-functional team, right? Uh, from program management, from recruiting, from like product leadership. Um, and it was specified, you know, what the responsibilities are for that group. Like this group needed to attend the project meetings. This group needed to contribute to developing the processes and content. And all of them were required to give feedback on all the deliverables that Ali, the accountable, uh, set for them. And in the consulted uh, list, we had our, you know, co-CEO. We had the wider, you know, HR team across the different offices, as well as the recruiting teams, as well as a wider group of PM leaders. Um, and these folks just, you know, provided input and feedback as needed, but didn't actually have to create content with, with a project lead. And then we made sure to inform everybody in the, you know, in the PM team, as well as the wider, you know, uh, stakeholder teams. So this, this also helps a lot, I think, in communication so that you know, like, who should you communicate to um, for what kinds of information um, and where to like, you know, how to communicate feedback, like this framework also really helps um, when you have to do everything asynchronously. Um, we're also big fans of user manuals at Gojek. And I think I've seen more user manuals sprout up since uh, we went fully remote. It's essentially like a one pager, right? Where you outline, you know, your working style, uh, what your, you know, your personal SLA, your service level agreement is. Uh, I think often you get SLAs for like certain policies or certain teams, but you know, we kind of treat this as like an SLA for like individuals. Um, I think it's really helpful uh, during work from home, especially for people with families, right? Uh, when, and people like me in a different time zone where, you know, the working hours might be less predictable than uh, everybody else. So, in my user manual, I kind of, you know, go through like what my travel schedule is. I talk about, you know, what times I will be online roughly. I link to my calendar where people can see at any given time when I'll be online and when I'll be sleeping. Uh, I specify some of the expectations I have around meetings uh, and how to schedule uh, things with me and how to like basically get things prioritized um, into my team and my workload. Um, so we, we basically have this uh, directory in Gojek where like you can, you know, 
uh, get a list of every, you know, everybody's user manuals who have, you know, had them and you can basically see how they work and engage with them most effectively by reading their user manual. And I think that's incredibly important, uh, especially now since you can't kind of just meet a person face to face and kind of get a sense of, you know, what their working style is. And my favorite tool in the whole world that ha I think has really helped us during this time as we go remote, um, adoption, I think, across the organization of this tool has really increased in the last um, month or two, um, is Asana. Uh, it's a collaboration tool, a project management tool, you know, your own personal to-do system. Uh, it's a very, very flexible tool and we use it in a number of different ways. So first we use it to track our OKRs, our objectives and key results. Uh, if you can see the screenshot here, it's of the product management function, which I manage. Um, and it kind of shows um, all of our different key results uh, that we are responsible for delivering um, this quarter and next quarter. Um, and Every, every key result is assigned to a different person in the department and we update this, you know, um, this key result uh, on a weekly basis. So any stakeholder like, you know, my co-CEO Kevin can just pop into this view uh, of our OKRs and see at any given point, like how we're doing um, in our OKRs. And, you know, when I took this screenshot a few weeks ago, a lot of KRs were actually at risk uh, because we were falling behind schedule. Um, and so we do that for quite a few departments now, and it's been really helpful in just making sure that we can stay in sync on progress on different departments and product groups. Um, and it integrates very well into our day-to-day -day work. So it's not like an additional thing that we have to update. Um, all the tasks are integrated here. And so we just have to do a weekly update to summarize what's in progress and what's blocked. We also use Asana for all of our meeting logs. Um, this is a screenshot of a weekly meeting that I run with my PM uh, operations team. Um, so what you'll see here is at the very top is a section of Asana where you can just anybody in the team can drop in, you know, topics that they want to discuss in the next sync. Uh, we have 30 minutes uh, usually every week. So we also ask people to specify in the right column, right? How many minutes they think we should budget for that conversation. And then at the beginning of every, every meeting each week, we actually see how much time we have, prioritize the topics we wanna to talk about and put it into like the section for that specific, you know, for that specific date there. Now, the beauty of this is let's say, you know, you're running this meeting, you're taking notes, right? Um, and you're talking about a project you're working on together and you think, oh, okay, like actually we need to do this follow-up with this person, right? Let's assign that action item to Dion or let's action, uh, assign that action item, item to Kumara, uh, who is another team member. Um, you can actually do that in line, right, in Asana it, because it's a task management tool. Like even though every line item is your agenda topic and your discussion topic, you can also immediately assign like the task um, to somebody else uh, who's in that meeting. So it's very easy to like first um, make sure that like tasks stay accountable, but also it's always contextual within like the context of your meeting, which I really, really like about this. Uh, we track all our decisions also uh, in Asana. So here is uh, our decision log for our PM hiring program uh, that we maintain with, you know, the product leaders and our recruiting leaders and the PM operations team. Um, you can see that we have a queue, you know, of things that we need to decide on that we bring up during our discussions. Um, you know, there's nothing blocked right now, but like if we're blocked on the decision, we move it to that column. Once it's been decided, you know, we kind of check it off. Uh, we've decided we record the, you know, the decision in that Asana task. And then if at any point in the future, I kind of forget, hey, what did we decide on, you know, whether or not we want to expand our final interview panel for PMs? Um, I can just check in this decision log. You can see there at the top, like, oh, there's that decision. Let me check the notes. And then instead of kind of going back and forth trying to remember there's always one central place um, for all of your decisions and we're trying to incorporate this into all of our processes um, throughout all the different product groups and departments 
And this is unfortunately, you know, we can't show most of the content here, but this is a screenshot of, you know, a, a biweekly meeting that our head of product for Go Food runs with their cross functional stakeholders. So when they meet, they basically have already an agenda lined up for things that they need decisions on, things that they need updates on, things they want to like share impact and analysis on. And then they also can see, you know, all the things that are already in flight that like the product team and the stakeholders care about. And so when the meeting starts, it's very easy to have this cross-functional conversation because everything is already lined up and they don't have to kind of add new things. Like these are all kind of pulled from like their day-to-day -day projects already that they're maintaining and they just centralize it into the shared, you know, meeting and coordination that they have across different functions and teams. Um, and you can see here, right, there are so many different uh, people kind of working on different areas. There's different priorities. There's different pods, which is what we call our different, you know, sub teams within a group. And you can see like who you can you need to follow up with and like when things are due and everything is very visible so that you can run these meetings really effectively, even even though, you know, everybody is remote because all the information you need is actually there. Um, we also do portfolio tracking for individuals on my team using Asana. Um, I think there is, it's very easy, I think, to get pulled into many different directions as a product manager or a product leader. Um, so what we do to kind of ensure that we don't have too much um, work in progress at any given week is that I ask all of my, uh, the PMs who report to me to maintain this view uh, this portfolio view that they share with me and that they update uh, for me on a weekly basis. I ask to kind of see what are your top like five to six priorities in your P0 and your P1 bucket that, that you're actively focused on. And really, ideally, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be more than four to five buckets of work, right? And I want to see what they're prioritizing next. I want to see what is on kind of their back burner, but they're not actively working on. I want to see what they've delegated, but that, that they're keeping an eye on. I have this view for myself that my manager um, also looks at. And, you know, it's very easy to course correct when any given week, you know, he can see my work and it's like, actually, you shouldn't be spending time on helping marketplace with their PM staffing. I want you working on this workshop instead or on this product strategy instead, because he can see like the top, you know, four to five things that are taking up like my mind share in any given week. And I can do the same with all my team members to make sure that like the big buckets of work are the right priorities. Um, we also use a few different tools to protect our time. I think, as I mentioned earlier, when you're working from home, all the boundaries get quite fuzzy and it's kind of hard to protect your time. So uh, a tool that is uh, a new favorite for a lot of our PMs right now is Clockwise. It's this plugin to your Google Calendar that actually optimizes your focus time. So it tries to reschedule your meetings so that you have as much focus time as possible. And focus time is defined as like two hours or more of time that is not interrupted by meetings. Um, and so basically when you integrate with this tool, you can specify, you know, what are the meetings that can be moved around? And so for me, all of my one-on-ones are quite flexible, right? I don't want to move around big group meetings because they're hard to reschedule. Um, so I tend to like only choose my one-on-ones or the smaller group recurring meetings. I can tell clockwise, you know, you can reschedule this as long as it's like within the same day or within the same week. And then it runs every day and checks like the rest of my calendar and just automatically reschedules things so that um, my, my focus time is maximized. And that's been really, really helpful for our team. And it's been a really good tool. Um, we do a lot of async standups as well. Um, at least within my team, you know, we're spread across different time zones. So it's not always realistic uh, to do synchronous standups. Uh, so we only do weekly syncs. I know also that people have varying levels of internet connectivity. So I think this is good to be mindful of people who might not have, um, you know, the best connection at home. You might want to consider doing async standups instead of spending most of your standup time every day 
trying to like get this person to connect or like waiting for somebody to kind of get their connection back on track or trying to decipher what are they saying because you can't hear them because the connection is so bad. So I think async standups are a really good option um, during this time if, you're, if, if your team is distributed and maybe the connectivity isn't great. Uh, we also really like to humanize our standups with uh, what we call coffee chats or coffee talks. So in, instead of just, you know, posting what you did, what's upcoming and what your blockers are. I also asked my team to post an update on just what's going on in their lives. So like, these are the things that you might just talk about if you see each other in person, right? During like an in-person standup, but you might forget about if you're not seeing this person uh, live. So we just try to incorporate that into our process by like asking for like a personal update. And that's been really nice to kind of you know, do with my team. Sometimes, you know, they'll just like post a picture of their puppy and their baby. It's like, oh, yesterday I got to hang out with my puppy in the park outside. Um, and it's nice to kind of maintain that human connection. Um, and this is another one of my favorite um, tools in my toolkit is the silent meeting. Um, if you Google it, I think the silent meeting manifesto, there is a lot of, um, you know, uh, guidelines on how to run a silent meeting. Uh, but I really like this because uh, one, it really forces the meeting facilitator to think about whether or not a meeting is necessary because it requires some prep work. Um, the way it's done is you, if you're trying to like make a decision or you're having a discussion on a particularly hard topic and the group is larger, you know, it's helpful to actually do this as a silent meeting. So whoever is calling the meeting should prepare, you know, an agenda um, and create like a pre-reading material. Now, you know, I think a lot of people already do pre-reads for meetings or workshops, but the reality is most people don't actually read it beforehand. So this format actually uh, enforces that you read it together during the meeting at the beginning of the meeting. So for example, I might have a one hour meeting, right? To maybe um, discuss like what product direction to pursue or what decision we need to make on a product uh, strategy. And then I might create like, you know, uh, you know, a summary or analysis of what we know so far. Uh, and then a list of recommendations and options that we need to decide on. Um, and I put that all in a document with links to the data, with links to like the analysis and like all the different details. And then during that meeting, there's like a silent portion for like, let's say like 20 minutes out of the first hour, right? Where everybody is just looking at the same Google doc and then reading it thoroughly, leaving their comments, leaving their questions, uh, maybe plus oneing other people's comments, responding. The facilitator then can see during this time you know, what are the topics and comments and questions that people are gravitating towards? What are the top concerns? What are the top discussion uh, areas that we need to take a look at? Um, and at the end of the, you know, silent um, portion, then you can open it up to live discussion with a prioritized list instead of just going straight into discussion where you try to discuss everything. You actually start with the things that people want to talk about most. Um, and another beautiful thing about this format is that I think it's a lot more inclusive. Um, when I do this format uh, in different teams, almost always I will have, I will see people leave comments in the document where in, you know, the live meetings before, if we didn't have the silent portion, I would rarely actually hear their voice speak up at first. So this actually offers this opportunity for you know, people who might be shyer, who might be a bit more introverted, who are, aren't sure how to jump in, it offers them an opportunity to actually have their voice heard. Um, so that's, that's been um, one of my favorite things about silent meetings. Um, this is just a tiny tip that I really like. Um, Despite, I think, efforts of like product managers to try to block off focus time on their calendars, people schedule meetings a lot for PMs. We get pulled into meetings a lot, a lot. I think if you're a product manager on this call, you might identify with this. Um, I think, you know, all of us have tried different kinds of things like these are core working hours, no meetings, please, or like block off a time on our Google calendar. 
please don't schedule. This is block for focus work. But people try to schedule over it anyway, and then I feel bad when I decline a meeting. So what I do now to, to both make it clear that I won't attend a meeting like during my focus time and also feel better that I've set this expectation up front, I just say during that block, meeting scheduled during this time will be declined. And so when I do have to decline a meeting because somebody tried to schedule over my focus time, I don't feel bad because I already set that expectation very clearly that, you know, if you try, it's just going to be declined. Sorry. So that's been very effective in protecting my time. Okay. Last bit is how I, as a product manager and a product leader, stay sane during isolation and work from home. So a few tips. Um, I think I mentioned a couple times already, it's, you know, boundaries can be hard when, uh, when you are at home and everything kind of blends in together, your work life, your personal life, eating, sleeping, everything is all happening in one place. And I think add to that, like the day to day of a product manager can be pretty unpredictable, right? So even though I'm craving routine, like it's even more unpredictable during a time of crisis where I might get pulled into a last minute strategy meeting or like a decision making meeting, or I need to kind of address something um, that's a completely different priority from before. So even though structure is really helpful uh, during work from home, there are some compromises I've had to make to manage my time and energy. So it's like less about a rigid daily routine and more about making sure I have a predictable sequence of things that I do on any given week. So I have some sense of predictability, but I can be a lot more flexible in terms of, you know, what I'm doing day to day. Um, so, you know, if you, if you look at this, like I've set up like my weekly calendar so that I can be flexible enough to one, accommodate like the time zone difference with Asia and California, but also accommodate, you know, my personal needs. So Mondays and Tuesdays are my worst meeting days, basically. Um, Mondays I'm working from 9 a.m. to midnight. I front load most of my one-on-one -on -one meetings on Monday. Tuesday is kind of like my available for ad hoc meetings night. Um, and it's just, you know, I just know coming into every week that Mondays and Tuesdays are going to be exhausting. And knowing that I manage my time a lot better, like Sunday, and make sure to try to go to bed at a certain time. I know that I can sleep in on Tuesday, but should expect to stay up a lot later, like I am doing right now, right? I'll be staying up until 1 a.m. Uh, but then I can look forward to Wednesday because Wednesdays are kind of my rest days where I can sleep in. Uh, Wednesday nights is date night with my husband where I will do no meetings. And you know, my stakeholders know that, my coworkers know that, unless it's an emergency, I just won't take a meeting on Wednesday nights. And if I do take a meeting on Wednesday night because it's really urgent and can't be rescheduled, I set the expectation that Wednesday daytime, I will take off and I will spend time with my husband because Wednesday is date night. Um, so that kind of helps a lot. Like having, you know, even though I don't know like what my day will look like, I know that there's a, a kind of routine that I can still follow and like a flow that I can look forward to even when I have tougher days than others. I can still expect to like do all of my focus work on Friday because thankfully when I'm in California, um, it's Saturday uh, in Asia by the time Friday comes around. So I do a lot of my focus work on Friday because everybody is, you know, a lot of people is off for the weekend. So there's like less meeting requests anyway. So that's a little bit about how I set up my routine. And I think it's, you know, if you're a PM and like your day-to-day -day is unpredictable, you can at least try to make your week a bit more predictable. Um, a lot of people, I think, are trying to kind of stay, stay up to date with their, you know, goals, routines, you know, health targets um, during like work from home. And I think it's great to like try to have these goals for well-being. But I think also, you know, you need to be compassionate with yourself and like realize that like this is a time of anxiety. And like sometimes you will miss certain targets in certain days. Like, for me, like, you know, I'll have like grand plans to like make sure that like I do like my climbing and hangboarding practice on Monday, but Monday comes around and I'm like, I'm really tired. I really don't want to do this. Or like there's a bunch of meetings coming up and I'm like behind at a deadline. I can't do it on Monday. So instead of stressing about the fact that I, you know, you know, can't do it on a certain day, 
I just kind of set frequency targets. Like I want to make sure like, Hey, I want to be climbing three or four times a week. Well, I have a broken foot right now, so I can't do that. So like I have a different workout, but I, you know, tell myself I need to do X things, you know, X times a week. And then I'm flexible on when I do it, as long as I try to stay on target, um, including date night, having it twice a week on Wednesday, usually, and on the weekend. Um, and, you know, I think what, what's, what's become really uh, important to me is to estimate like everything so that I can manage my time and energy well. Um, I'll show you in the next slide, but like this means like estimating, scheduling and blocking everything on my calendar, not just work stuff, right? Not just like meetings, not just like buckets of work that I want to do at a certain time or on a certain day, but also my workouts, uh, my breaks, my time hanging out with family, when I want to take a quick break and take a walk around, you know, around, um, around my house. Um, it's related to, I think, managing expectations with your coworkers where like when you're in the office, right, you can kind of see, oh, like this person's not at their desk, maybe they're at a meeting or maybe they're out at lunch. But these schedules can change, especially if you have a family or like children in your home, right? So I think actually putting like all the different details on your calendar has been really helpful for me in managing expectations with my coworkers. Um, I've had to be even more mindful, I think, during this time because I'm doing everything a lot slower because of my surgery. Like I'm just not as mobile. Like showering is like a, a one, one hour, maybe like one and a half hour affair for me now because I have to be, you know, I'm on a walker. I need help from my husband to get in and out of the shower. I have to change my bandages. Um, and it just takes a lot longer if I don't budget for this then I'll be scrambling during my work day. So I just need to be a lot more mindful. And even if you're not recovering from surgery, I think it's really helpful to kind of break up your day like this so that you're not just working 24 seven with like no end in sight, right? Like I always have like time for a morning routine uh, and also like a wind down routine at night where I make sure I have like an hour and a half at the end of each night um, to wind down before I go to sleep. Um, so that means, by the way, for tonight, you know, going back to the theme of flexibility, I'll be up until 1 a.m. I expect to kind of stay up for another hour for my wind, wind down routine um, and go to bed at two, which means I've just, you know, had to push back like all of my schedule tomorrow on Wednesday to accommodate this. So even though, you know, the, the sleep time isn't ideal, I want to make sure that I don't overcompromise because sleep is important. So I just adjust my schedule the next day and set that expectation with my team. So this is a typical week. My calendar is very sacred and that's how I stay sane. And I think uh, how a lot of product managers at Gojek stay sane is actually being, you know, very mindful about how they manage their calendar. So what you're seeing here, for example, in light green, I need to show my coworkers my working hours because I'm 15 hours behind everybody else in Jakarta, right? So colleagues, you know, can look at my calendar and look at the green blocks and see when I'm working. And some of it, like, they, they don't really care because it's between 2 and 7 a.m. Um, uh, in Jakarta. But, you know, they can see when I'm available for meetings that's overlapping with their time zone. Um, I block off when, people, when I'm sleeping. Those are the blocks that you see in black uh, on the calendar. Uh, because otherwise people sometimes forget that I'm not in Asia and accidentally schedule over it. And then I'm like, no, I can't attend that very important meeting you just scheduled because it's at 3 a.m. So this way, like when they try to schedule something, they'll see, oh, right, she'll be sleeping during this time. Don't schedule that meeting then, maybe another time. Um, you know, and I, I make sure that there's enough time for focus work. All the dark green slots have been automatically scheduled by Clockwise, the tool that I uh, shared with you earlier. And I budget time for my personal needs. Like those are really important. Like as you can see, um, like the light purple ones are basically the, um, the things that I need to take care of personally from physical therapy, from my morning routine, uh, from, you know, making sure that I have, uh, time with my husband on Wednesday nights. Those are all, all reflected and everybody, all of my coworkers can actually see this. And I think last but not least, um, during a time of uncertainty like this, I think it's really important to practice gratitude. Um, a lot of us, uh, if you're attending, you know, this go talk means like you're, you're still able to work from home. Um, and a lot of people who are affected by this crisis 
cannot. And I think during a time of anxiety and stress like this, it's easy to forget like what we still have and what we can be grateful for. And there's huge bodies of research that say that like a gratitude practice can, you know, uplift your mood and make you more effective. And, um, and so I try to do this every day, a real, uh, an app that I really have enjoyed using during this time to do my gratitude journaling is this app called Jur. I don't know if it's available on Android, but it's uh, this really beautiful app on iOS. Um, that allows me to just check in and like just say like one or two things I'm grateful for every day and it really sets the tone for the rest of my day. Um, even when you know some days feel like wow there's so much uncertainty and anxiety and I'm really stressed out I don't even know what I'm stressed out about sometimes but if I just take pause and like write a few things down that I'm grateful for it usually helps. So that's one of my uh, one of my tips. So to recap right um, Hope this has been helpful for you but you know there, there there's been three parts to to like how i've been thinking about product management during coronavirus crisis uh, there's obviously the high level of like how pms can you know stay on top of what i like to call like wartime product management i think if you google that um, i can also share a few links in the zoom there's some really good reading on how, like how to take some of the skills you have as a product manager and make sure that they still apply during like wartime versus like what you have learned during peacetime. Um, I think it's very mindful, like it's important to be mindful of like what to do during this time, which can look very different and like what you do during peacetime. Um, and really important, I think when you're remote to like manage expectations, use like a tool to document everything and to protect your time. If you want to learn a little bit more about this, we actually wrote a whole blog post about it. You can check it out at bit.ly slash work from home Gojek. It's on the screen. Um, and then, yeah, how I personally stay sane. And I, I'd love, you know, I think if we have time here at the end to hear some stories and ideas on how all of you uh, are, are, are staying, you know, uh, well and sane during this time of uncertainty and, you know, complete remote working from home. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Yay. What's so insightful session, Median. Um, thank you so much for sharing. We have a lot of questions on the Q and A. Um, and also, uh, my personal question is you mentioned that you and your team revisiting the objective and as a leader how you kind of like justify their performance review during this kind of situation you know that there is maybe internet connection error or some pms or some of your team maybe as a parents they have to like involve in the kids school school schedules or also they facing like mental health issue how you like human I justify the per their performance review mm -hmm. yeah I think um, this is the print like the one principle I live by is like during this crisis like I like I know that for a lot of people they will not be at their usual best right and especially if like you know with with other obligations like family obligations there's like even more additional stress luckily you know it's just for me it's just me and my husband but even that like comes with its own stress we're cooped up in the same house all the time and i can only imagine what it's like for you know my team members who have families um and other um you know young children that looks really different right so i think I, i've told like every single one of my team members you know, I want you to like try your best, but I know that in some cases, some days you will not be at your best and we should account for that, right? And, um, and acknowledge that you might not be doing your best. Uh, but also like, I wanna hold them accountable to setting the right expectations. I think during this time, it's all about um, setting the right expectations and over communicating. So if you know, for example, somebody on my team, like I think her, her mother actually like, fell down the stairs and I was like, oh my God, like, yes, please take care of her and like nurse her to health. But tell me, you know, like when your hours are going to be so that I know like, and, and whether or not you need to take like half days on certain days so that, that I know how to manage your output. So I think for me, it's all about managing expectations um, so that there are no surprises, right? Does that answer your question? Okay, let's go to the, yeah. Definitely. Uh, let's go to the Q&A box. That is um, 
couple of questions. We can go with the most quoted one. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the first one around recommendations on framing lists of project tasks and project management tools. I don't think there's a one size fits all. And um, what, as um, for me, uh, I think it's important to like frame certain things in terms of like the problem that you are trying to solve and not just jumping straight to the solutions. Right. And I think with like for us in Asana, we actually have um, the flexibility of having different views of the same uh, project because any task or any like epic, I guess, can live in multiple um, projects. So you can set up a view where, you know, it's very timeline oriented. Like for example, we have um, a launch calendar project that cuts across all the different groups, right? And like from GoFood, from Transport, from uh, GoLife, from like GoPay. Um, and it actually shows all of their key launch dates for certain, um, for certain product features all in one place. It's very timeline oriented. The consumers of this uh, project view are mostly like business stakeholders who want to know when are things launching and like if it's delayed, I want to know, right? So, but on the other hand, like those um, product uh, features also live in different projects for those product groups. And some of the product groups has a, have a view where it's like bucketed by the problems that they're trying to solve with a customer or by the objectives and key results. So I think there's no one like uh, one size fits all and using Asana, we're actually able to create those different views for the different um, needs that we have. Okay. Then do you have any recommendation for online course for student? This good talk. <laughs> uh, I don't have specific recommendations. I think Coursera has uh, a, like, if it's around product management, I think Coursera has some uh, courses. Um, I think though that like product management is best learned by doing. So I think finding like a company that has a strong program for, um, yeah, okay, let me, let me answer this. I think there are two ways to like learn product management. Um, at the base of it, like it needs to be through doing, but th there are two paths to it two main paths to it that I see. One, you can join a larger company, right? Like a, like a Gojek or a, a Facebook or a Google. Um, and where they have programs for like entry level product managers and can support them kind of growing all the way into more senior product managers, or you can go the startup route where you kind of go in and you can come in as a generalist and like wear a bunch of different hats, but also practice, you know, some product management. So I think you will learn different things and be trained in different ways, but those are two paths. Um, and mm -hmm. I think courses are just like supplemental. I think experience is like the best way to do it. Yeah. And to add note, if you want to join like online course, you can join our GoTalk session. We will have more in the future. And also uh, Mutia here as a pan uh, one of our panelists now, maybe we can, we'll share you in a, um, in a chat about our Go Academy program that you can join online. Next, how to introduce this remote culture to your team? Oh, this might be coming from like company, like rigid one. Yeah. I think it's easy to open. Yeah. It's definitely not easy. Um, and, you know, I had challenges too. Um, but I think it's, for, for me, it's, I had to start small, right? Instead of trying to introduce it to everyone, I started with, you know, a small, like, first my own team that I had direct control over, right? Um, so that's easier to start there. And if, you know, if a certain tool or a certain culture um, kind of takes off in a smaller setting, then you can try to push it out further. Um, so I think it's a, like for me, the different types of things that I try to push for a remote culture, the pitch was like, how do I make your life better by doing this, right? So with silent meetings, you know, I tried it first within my own small team. I was like, oh, this works. You know, I beta, beta tested it basically. I was like, this is cool. And so when I wanted to bring it to like a larger team and it was pretty large, I brought it to like, you know, the entire leadership team um, when we were doing our OKR monthly review, um, that was scary. But the pitch was, you know, by doing this, I'm going to be able to reduce the time you spend in this meeting by 50%. So 
let's try it. And so I think in terms of introducing like new culture, it's about kind of pitching it as like, how, like what does this do for you, right? Uh, what is the benefit to you? And I think if you approach it that way, like you will probably gain more adoption. And at least that's what it's been like in my experience. Okay, wait, okay. So the people can share their experience, yeah. Okay, do you mm -hmm. have, oh, and this is already answered. And then, oh, this is a question from Saibu Fris. I have a question as a one developer thing in my office. My mm -hmm. stakeholder changed the request. Okay, how are you as a PM <laughs> saying this changes? Yeah, um, a couple of things I would try. This, this is tough. Um, so I would approach this in three ways. I think the PM needs to be held accountable to like actually freezing a decision, right? Um, and ideally, like once you kind of set like a drop dead kind of date for like, hey, this is when like the scope should be frozen, then you can't go back. Um, and I think there should be like higher barriers to like when that can happen. So, um, so I think set a deadline and do it. Uh, if you have a decision log, right, like what I had uh, with uh, my team, it's a lot easier to say like, you already decided this and you have like went back and forth on this three times, like then you can hold this person more accountable. Um, and then the third way, I think, um, well, I guess during this time, I think also be more mindful that I think things are evolving really quickly um, and that this might happen more often than before. If it's already happening before, then maybe that is a problem in terms of like how uh, you are setting expectations between PM and development and like when things should be frozen versus not. So that's a separate issue. But if this is a new thing that's happening, that's kind of emerged as part of like the crisis, then I think I would also encourage folks to be a bit more mindful that like the market is changing really, really fast. Um, so have, have a frank conversation with your PM and kind of understand, you know, where they're coming from and then problem solve, like, you know, the right structure to solve it. Um, hope that helps. Um, okay. yep. And then what made you prefer Darcy? Instead of other? Um, great question. I think um, both frameworks actually work pretty well. Um, I think there is a uh, RACI and RACI are also used at Gojek. So I think Darcy is just like one example. Um, so there's, I just have a preference for it because it's like what I'm more used to. And so that's been like adopted in my department. But I've also seen uh, RACI and RACI uh, use at Gojek and, and we use that too if it's appropriate. Okay. During this pandemic, what happened if a member from your team, or oh, this is, I think, same with my question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the best way to conduct usability testing? You wanna answer this or no? That's great. Um, well, I'm not the best person to answer this, but I know that our research team is uh, testing out new ways to do this. Uh, I think they're doing like, you know, focus uh, discussion groups over Zoom. Um, there, I think, I think also like doing it on Instagram, even, um, I think there are also, if you can afford the tool, right. I think there are like ways to like do this on like user testing.com. Uh, so there's like a lot of tools out there and I think we're still learning how to do this effectively because not all of our users can also, you know, get, um, you know, get online and get on video and talk to us. So I think that's why, you know, our, our researchers are also testing out like this way to get feedback through like Instagram chats and comments. Um, so I'm not the best person, but um, I can find out more and we can share that. I think, I think we are sharing that probably uh, in, the, in the near future from the research team. Yeah, we will conduct one of um, research team as well. Okay, how do you facilitate lead and brainstorm remotely? Um, silent meetings, my number one go-to tool. Uh, number two, I think having like a strong like tool where you can easily um, um, put in like your comments and like votes, etc. Um, Asana is also really good for that. We ran somebody uh, and Gojek ran like a quarterly retrospective with engineers, PMs, business stakeholders, and it was really effective. Um, I think having yeah, I. I, I really encourage people to try like the silent meeting format for brainstorms um, and discussions remotely. It's really, really awesome. 
Okay. Silent meeting is from Amazon, right? Amazon. I think it's from Amazon, yeah. Yeah. Um, what is your biggest challenge of WFH and how you overcome it? WFH. Um, let's see. I think for me right now, I, I went over a few already, but like maybe something new that I haven't talked about is usually even, you know, like I mentioned, I'm in California, but like we were in the process of relocating to Jakarta and like the past two years, like usually I'm in Jakarta, like every one or two months. So I'm there, like I can, I can see what's going on in the market. I can like talk to customers directly. I can talk to our researchers more frequently. Right now I feel really far removed. Um, that's been really challenging um, because it's been, what, five months since I've been back y'all, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so I think for me, the way I overcome it is like um, more direct lines to like my research leads and like just proactively asking them for more information and spending more time reading like research reports and also like kind of macro trends around like what's happening in the market. Um, I'm allocating more time to that than I used to before because I feel really far away from what's happening in, in our markets right now. Okay. Um... Do you want to pick question, but mm, okay, I can just uh, let's see. Should I go from Q and A or from chat? Q and A. Q and A. Okay. What's the difference between Jira and Asana? What a great question. Um, actually, so you know, Gojek was like on so many different tools to manage our work in product and engineering. I think we had like more than a dozen. <laughs> Um, what a scary thought. So we are actually right now in the process of standardizing everything on Asana and Jira. So the way that we have decoupled it is that engineering work um, is tracked in Jira and everything else prior to that lives in Asana, uh, including like their like non engineering like projects like we have a program management team managing all that. Um, they all live in Asana and we're in the process of setting up integrations between uh, Jira and Asana because product managers and business stakeholders of products kind of have to have that view and we want to make sure that we as product managers and engineering managers don't need to maintain two sources of truth. So what is in Jira needs to be represented correctly in Asana for the things that we care about related to engineering milestones. So hope that answers the question. Okay. Um... As you mentioned, okay. The next questions, do you have any tips on manage or stakeholder expectation? Uh, I, well, this is like, I think a mm -hmm. question that is relevant even during not Corona time. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I think for me, I, I tend to over communicate um, and so one framework I like to use, I think is from the get go, right. When, like when you're, you're promising something to like deliver like a task or a product or a deadline, I think as a PM, you need to kind of have a sense of like the level of confidence in which you can deliver that thing or that product. And so if you have low confidence in something, you should call it out from the very beginning. So that kind of sets the expectation from the get go. If you have high confidence that you can do something by the allocated amount of time, then you should also call that out and be expected to help be held accountable to delivering that on time. But if you know that something is, you know, really unpredictable or risky, um, then you should call it out to your stakeholders from the very beginning and say like, this is what I'm going to target but here are all the different risks and it might move by this much and I will keep you posted on, you know, a recurring basis, like it would be like weekly, bi-weekly, just, I think it's all about managing expectations when, when, you know, the level of certainty can fluctuate. Okay. Okay. Um, we still have many more. Do you want to pick like three more? Yep. I'll take the, can you share a framework on how to do new product discovery during Corona time? I'm actually developing this right now with one of our product heads. Um, the way that we are thinking about it right now, 
um, is first uh, scenario planning a little bit, right? You want to, right now, as I said, like there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of like, when is the market recovering? How long is this going to last? When is the crisis going to be over? Um, will it get worse before it gets better? We don't know. So, but we can hypothesize, like, let's say, you know, and so basically first we start with the possible scenarios. Let's say market returns to normal, like by June or July, or things go on until the end of the year, or things don't change until like the first quarter of 2021. And so, so basically we were trying to develop like these different strategies based on like the potential scenarios. And for each of those potential scenarios, right, we kind of take a look at like a product group and like take a look at what are the risks, you know, uh, to the business and the product um, if this scenario happens. Um, and then also if the scenario happens, what are the opportunities, right? Um, and so by bucketing it in those kind of terms, then you kind of start getting a list of like, here are all the different things that we could be doing to address those risks and opportunities. And then you can start connecting the dots and prioritizing based on like one, like the likelihood of that happening, but also like how big of a risk that is to your business um, and to your metrics. So this is early stages of us developing this framework. So I haven't like seen it like go from end to end and we don't have the output yet, but that's how we're currently thinking about it. Sure, okay. Mm, you want to pick two more? Can you share how do you choose? I think this one is interesting question, but how you choose those methods that you apply in Mojo? Um, or yeah. eight years experience? Great question. Um, I think I pro approached it like a product manager, actually. So it's like not picking specific. Like it was never around like, oh, I have these specific solutions that I want to try, right? It's more about, I have this problem right now that's like getting in the way of me being effective um, and working remotely. What are some of the solutions that I can try, right? Because that's like my approach. And I think what like a good product manager's approach is to like implementing solutions is to start at like the customer problem where the customer is like myself and like my coworkers right now. So instead of like kind of deciding, oh, I'm going to try a silent meeting, it's more like, Oh my God, like this funk, like this monthly cadence with so many people um, is taking many, many hours of our time. And the discussion is always all over the place. Um, and people like it always goes over time and we don't discuss the right things. What are some solutions for that? And that's when I can, like, I've known about the silent meeting before, but never really implemented it. But then this was a very clear use case where like, this might be the solution to the problem. So I think that's the way I think about it. Like, what's the problem? Find different solutions, try it out. Just, just like what I would do with, you know, customer problems and product solutions. Okay. What are unexpected perks? Work from home as a PM. Oh my God, focus time. You know, when you're a PM, like in the office and like your engineer is like, Emma, or like your researcher is like, hey, look at this thing. Or like your boss is like, hey, do you have like five minutes and it turns into like a 90 minute conversation? When you work from home, that barrier to just like poke you uh, becomes a lot higher. So you just end up having a lot more focus time and the meetings are a lot more intentional. So I think that's been a part. Also, I get to work with my cat who is currently sleeping right now. So I can't show you my cat. <laughs> okay, let's pick the last one. What do you think? Oh, but I like this one. How to bid in order to discipline yourself to run work from home. Self-discipline. <laughs> it's a tough one. Yang mana sih? Dua sendiri. Oh, if you guys not comfortable asking question in English, you can just answer a question in Bahasa. Yes. Aku bisa Bahasa. Just, you know, just in case. <laughs> People, yeah. I don't know. Do we have English speakers even English. on this? <laughs> Some, I think it, um, there is a lot of people from like outside Indonesia joining this. Okay. Betul, Mbak Dian tuh orang Medan, guys. Guys, <laughs> I sounds like YouTubers, yeah. Saying guys, it feels like one of the YouTubers things. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yes, it's true. I am orang Medan. 
Um, Oke, okay. tadi yang mana nih, Yong? Um, do you wanna answer the self-discipline thing or other? Or people can vote, like... Coba, uh, maybe we do some voting. Yep. How? I think self-discipline also... Um, the one that you... Here's also, there's a question about like, working overtime during work from home. It's also need to self discipline. Yeah. How do you practice self discipline? But you've been working from home since, like, I, I mean, you've been working remotely for about like six years and more. Mm-hmm. How you practice your self discipline? Yeah, I think it's a constant work in progress. Like, you know, um, some days <laughs> it's not perfect, but I think having those like calendar blocks like really help me because like when I'm in the middle of like something and I start to forget, you know, that uh, that I'm. Like if I didn't have a calendar reminder to say like, hey, it's dinner time or like, hey, it's time to shower, then I will not actually be reminded that it's time to move away from whatever I'm working on. So that really helps a lot. Um, I think having a manager that holds me accountable is also helpful. So if you have a man, if you are a manager, right, uh, hold your team accountable. Like if you see them pass like a certain working hour that you've agreed that like, hey, you're not supposed to work after like 6 p.m. Uh, and you see mm-hmm. them at 1 a.m., I don't know, I shame my team members like publicly in Slack. I'm like, why are you still awake? Go to sleep, right? Because like, it'll be yeah. like in the morning for me, but like it's like 1 a.m. or 11 p.m. for them. And I'm like, why are you awake and responding to me? Like, go away. Like, you shouldn't be responding. Um, so I think as leaders and managers, like we should be comfortable doing that. And then celebrating like when people are saying like, hey, um, I want to, you know, do this thing and take care of a personal thing. Celebrate it in front of everybody so that people, you know, don't feel like, you know, that it's a bad thing for them to do that. Um, yeah, and for me, like, it's all about like, calendaring everything and reminding myself. It's about setting up systems, I think, so that, you know, habits are all about, you know, triggers and making it easy to do the habit and making it hard to kind of break a habit or do a bad habit, right? So like, for me, the trigger is like the calendar. Um, and then for me, I think also, I never worked in bed. Right, because if I start working in bed, it's a lot easier for me to just like go from like work to bed, from from sleeping straight to work. So like I always, you know, even though I'm really tired, I'm sitting at my desk. Even though I'm really tired, I change out of my pajamas into a different set of pajamas to start my day. So that it's like kind mm-hmm. of a mindset shift. So it's like those little like triggers that that are my hacks, I think. Yeah, you guys can check our work from home got land in bit be- be- dot slash wfi ya yeah? uh, bitly ya yeah, slash hold on i can i can paste it um, yeah we'll we'll send you an e- yeah. email after this session mm-hmm. including the summary and all the link that but dian mentioned before yeah. um and also there's a question about like how managing okr we will have another session of go talk which talking about like okr and um mentoring and something like that and okay i think that's all or do you still want to ask any questions We can answer um, through email, yeah. Uh, you want me to answer a couple more questions? I think we have a few more minutes, yeah? Yeah, okay. Okay, let's see. How about like, come on, y'all, y'all vote on some things so that I know which one is the... the yeah, um, people also vote for it. I'll, I'm gonna vote, sip vote, my vote, coffee vote. for a few minutes and then wait for the votes to come in. But Ian, what's your uh, book or movie recommendation? I know that you before Watching Peaky Blinders, but any other movies or book during this COVID situation? Um, let's see. Uh, Peaky Blinders is very violent. <laughs> um, <laughs> what else do I like? One, um, I really like cooking shows. So like the British baking show is very soothing, I think, because the people are so nice. So like when you're like stressed out and anxious, you can just have that playing in the background and it's very pleasant. So that's my go-to de-stressing show it's like baking shows okay maybe if we put local one siska sweet omo yeah cooking show mm-hmm. <laughs> and book are you, do you have any book recommendation yes uh depends on what what am i reading right now i'm looking at my books um i'm reading daily stoic this i think this is okay you ask uh, you ask questions about Indian, but i want really want to answer this one is good one <laughs> Like everyday motivation, yeah. so you are not anxious. 
um, a lot of the um, a lot of the things that I learned or like the principles that I learned came from like this book called Making Time. So like how to make basically how to make time for the things that matter the most, right? So it's called Making Time. It's by the writers who actually um, wrote Design Sprint, which is also a really great book if you want to like prototype and do like sprints for discovering new products and solutions. Um, making Time. Yeah, that's a good book. A book that I'm starting to read right now that I haven't read yet, so I can't recommend it, but I think might be really relevant to our time is it's called The Messy Middle. Finding your way through the hardest and most crucial part of any bold venture. And I feel like because of this crisis, all of us are kind of like in the middle of a messy thing. So I'm really excited to read this. Okay, let's answer the most three folded questions. Superman or super team? Um, I find super team, yes. of course. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think the question here is like around like having like a superhero versus like having like a functional like collaborative mm -hmm. team. And for me, I will always index on like, um, you know, having a super team. Because I think if you have, even if you have like a charismatic genius who's like amazing and smart, if they can't collaborate with other people or like create a toxic environment, then you're, effect you're, then you're not as effective as a team. And I think ultimately, like it's a team that delivers work, not just one person. So I will always choose a team over one person. Okay. It's possible for us graduates apply as product manager? Great question. Um, I wish the answer was yes, but I think right now, probably not because we are, we don't have like a solid like program in place where we can ensure that you as somebody who is entry level can have the right structures and support that you need to develop and grow as a product manager. That is my goal. And I think soon we will be able to support that. But I think right now, because of the pace that we move at, like it would be a disservice, I think, to somebody with no background in product management to come in and just do it and not have the right support systems and the right managers to do it. So mm -hmm. soon, the answer will okay. be yes, I hope. Yeah, maybe first grad can start joining bootcamp so you can learn the basic first. Yeah, or, or another way is like if you have a computer science degree, you can join as an engineer and we have a more, I think we have a more developed internal transfer program. So yeah, that, that is something that I could recommend. Last one. What is your cat, but? Lagi tidur. He is asleep. So okay, like, her cat name is uh, Starsky. Yeah, he's on Instagram if you want to follow him at Starsky, the cat, on Instagram. So you can see him there. Cat on Instagram. Okay, I'll type the answer. Okay. Okay, that's all, folks. Um, okay. if, you have <laughs> if you have many more questions, you just can shoot um, email to us and maybe I pass to Badian or you can follow Badian in LinkedIn or, in, or follow the cat. So the cat more famous than her. <laughs> and we definitely have, we'll have more session of Go Talk. We have like talking about OKR, talking about a lot of things, research, and you can also give us feedback. You can email to community at Gojek, or you can just feel free to uh, fill the feedback form that will be shared to you after this session. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Badian. I know that wet wet day is no meeting day for you or it's still Tuesday no, in it's still Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. So you're okay. <laughs> okay. So okay. have a good sleep and everyone please stay safe, stay healthy, wash your stay at home. Um hope you all guys stay safe during this corona situation and we can meet directly in the office maybe in the future. And thank you Median once again. Thank you all for joining. I'll close the session. Thank you all. See you in the next Go Talk. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye.